everybody here tonight take a songbook we're going to sing together while we're singing the children will come in and they'll get ready to sing but we're going to sing let's see standing on the promises 323 323 in your book and once you have it why don't you stand up to sing standing on the promises and brother bob will lead us Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises sing Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Let's sing that last together. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Great singing. Good to see everybody tonight. Looking forward to hearing the children sing. Let's pray together and then we'll have them sing for us tonight. Father, we bow before you in prayer. Thank you for another opportunity for us to be together here in the middle of the week. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts tonight. You'll give us just what we need here in the middle of the week. The shot in the arm that we, we need to have to keep on going for thee. Lord, meet the needs of each individual here tonight. Now, bless the children as they sing for us. Help each of them to do their best and to remember uh, what they have memorized and what they've worked on over these past weeks. And I pray it'll be a blessing not only to those of us who are listening, but it'll be a blessing to you as well, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated.
When we all get to heaven, number seven, eight. Brother Bob. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. On that first together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. On that third, let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. Get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Do the chorus one more time and listen, the kids shouted. We're allowed to shout, all right? <laughs> We'll sing and shout the victory, all right? You got to shout the victory, okay? Do that chorus one more time. All right. Bob, let's shout. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory.
celebrate tonight's letters from the Knickerbocker family missionaries to Nepal. Dear prayer partners and supporting friends, here are a few interesting stories to share with you. We have been super busy, but are loving every second of the life and ministry here. A couple of years ago, after first arriving in Nepal, Luke went, to, Luke went with Brother Justin to a nearby hospital. While making balloons for some children, he met a girl named Sristi and her family. Sristi came to a couple of our church services, but we haven't seen her for over a year. However, after the earthquake, Luke got a message from a stranger named Vikash. He was afraid of dying and wanted to meet up at his house south of the city. Luke, Justin, and Gayatso visited his family and went through the gospel. They affirmed that they were truly born again, but just not walking with the Lord. Vikash is Sristi's cousin. Vikash is serious about serving the Lord and attends a church near his house. He comes to our area for business from time to time and visits with Luke, asking many Bible questions. He introduced Luke to more family that live nearby. Two months ago, his cousin Premud was in poor health due to alcohol. Luke and Justin prayed with him and shared the gospel. His Christian uncle happened to show up in time to lead him in the sinner's prayer for salvation. A few days later, he brought his two sons, wife, and mother to church. After the service, his wife and mother wanted to be saved. God has been doing a great work in their lives, and Premud is now working again and reading his Bible at night before bed. His family has been coming faithfully. You may remember about a year and a half ago, we met an elderly lady named Dolma Sherpa through literature distribution. She had brought a crumpled paper from our church she had found in the basement of a monastery where she lived. She began attending our services and we learned she was very confused about salvation. About a month ago, she finally realized Jesus alone could forgive her of her sin. She trusted Christ as her savior during a Bible study with Cheryl and Naima in our church. Our language teacher who is Nepali invited us to, to a special celebration for his two new grandkids. Jamie and I went and were surprised to see a Tibetan family sitting at a table next to us. Luke mentioned the area of Mustang where he visited last summer. They were excited because that is where they were from. We soon learned that they were related to Gayatso, who was one of our faithful young men studying in the Bible college. The uncle in particular has been very resistant to Gayatso's faith. As we were talking, we learned that one of the family members named Pima grew up in a Christian children's home. She was very interested in our church. She has come several times, but has gone back to the village for work. But it has been very encouraging to, to know God is still working in this family in many ways. We know that the seed sowing is hard and takes time here in Nepal, but God is moving and we are encouraged. We are excited to have some visitors coming from Texas this week. Please be in prayer that God will continue to increase laborers in this needy field that God may be glorified, the Knickerbockers. Amen. Exciting to see things happening there, isn't it? And uh, we're rejoicing with them. All right, get your uh, prayer guide out, would you? Anybody need one tonight? Everybody get one? Very good, fellas. Thank you. Mary Lou, need one? Oh. You got you got two there, all right. Never mind, Sandra's, re Sandra's on it. All right. We start on the back as usual with the coming events and uh, be praying for the RU Inside Thursday night down at the CRC prison and the RU Friday night here <clears throat> at the church and then uh, Saturday morning out at London, 8.30 to 10.30 for our normal soul winning bus visitation at 10 a.m. on Saturday and uh, then um, be praying for the RU National Conference coming up. That's the April 13 through 16 over in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, that Wednesday evening, you'll get to hear Brother Neil Hendricks. Uh, he's recovered uh, from his sickness and uh, looking forward to being here on that Wednesday night, and so that'll be a great time for you here, all right? And um, on the inside, <coughs> want to remember uh, that what well, we want to praise the Lord for the great Sunday, uh, wonderful attendance both morning and evening, and again, just a great job by the choir Sunday night. Uh, that was that was a wonderful presentation, and we enjoyed it very much. And uh, the results from the RU inside there, both on Thursday at CRC in London <coughs> on Saturday. And then uh, on the top, continue to pray for the different church ministries and these on the health list. Uh, Brother Wallace came through his procedure well, and uh, he's resting tonight in, uh, in his room there, and I'll be home tomorrow, I'm sure, if all goes well. 
and uh, continue to pray for a complete recovery for him and adjusting to the defibrillator pacemaker that they put in uh, to him today, all right? Uh, on the health list there, uh, if you will add uh, Kent Jett, J-E-T-T, -T, Kent Jett Sr. This is Susan Wood's uncle, okay? He's in the hospital right now in very serious condition, and uh, so we need to lift him up in prayer, all right? Please pray for him. And uh, right now, the last name on that list, DeAndre Bush, was supposed to have his feet amputated uh, this past Monday, and that did not happen. <coughs> he still still has them for now, but he's got diabetes very bad, and that's what they're they're trying to still do some work to save his feet. And as of now, it's they they have not had to amputate those. All right, but keep lifting him up in prayer. All right, uh, on the uh, inside there on the cancer list, uh, add Tom Hamby there, would you please? I meant to have that in here permanently. We'll have it in there for next week, but uh, Brother Tom has cancer, and this isn't something that, that they want a lot of publicity about. There's some uh, business reasons for that, but uh, Brother Eddie, I talked to him this week, and uh, just just pray for Brother Tom. Some of you have been around. You, you know the Hambys, and uh, of course, Brother Eddie does uh, Bible school uh, for us every year, has for many years. Uh, this is his dad, and uh, just just pray for him. They're they're waiting to see if he'll be approved. To there's a new experimental drug that they they want to use on him. They'd like him to be part of, but you have to apply and see if you qualify and that kind of thing. So uh, just just pray for him on the additional on the cancer list. All right, continue to pray for these on the salvation list, and uh, of course the un unreached people groups uh, of the world, and then. The missionaries highlighted tonight by the Knickerbockers and the good work that the Lord's doing for them. Brother Paul Abel, I'd like you to come if you would please. I want you to lead us in our prayer this evening and uh, John will come and lead us in our prayer. Be praying for the services coming up on Sunday. And we start the month of April and uh, be an exciting time and uh, we'll look forward to what the Lord will do for us then. Brother John will lead us in prayer tonight. Pray along with him silently as he leads us audibly and let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming to be able to come to church and hear the Word of God preach. And we pray that you'd be with the pastor tonight as he opens the Word of God and preaches to us. And we pray that we'd be hearers of the doer, hearers of the Word, not only, but to be workers. We ask that you'd be with the, the missionaries that we have support of, and we ask that you'd uh, help each one of them as they are in different countries and united across the united states that you'd give them the rest they need and then also give them the power that they need as they stand behind the pulpits and preach the word of god and, and we do pray that you'd uh, be with uh, the are you group that we have here at the church that goes into the prisons and then the ones that meet here on friday night we ask that you'd continue to work in the, these hearts of these young men that uh, have reached the bottom and we pray that you'd help them uh, get get their uh, word of God preached to them, and that they're able to use it in their lives, and that their lives be changed as they when they leave here and we'll leave the are you groups. We ask that you would continue to help them as they uh, across many many roads that some of us would never even think of crossing, but they've already done that. And we ask that you would help them to continue to be under the word of God preached to them each day, each week. And we ask that you would help them now as they study the material they have that they need to to stay in to help them become uh, better better christians we ask that you would help us now as we uh, think of our missionaries uh, that are overseas and we ask that you would help them give them every need that they have that they need to be met and then we also pray for our military that are in different countries and around the world that are there to help us and protect us we ask that you'd uh, help them and give them the, the word of god preached to them each week as they some of them have uh mi missionaries in their own country and we ask that you'd help them we pray for cancer that uh, there's many on the um, on the list we ask that you'd help them continue to get better and if that's your perfect will and if it's not your will that, that you'll help them through this time and give them comfort and then we pray for uh Brother Bob Wallace, is, he has had this defibrillator put in today, and we pray that it 
work properly and to help him get back up on his feet. And then we pray for Susan's uh, uncle that you'll help her, him. And we just pray that you uh, watch over those these ones on our list of uh, health needs. And we just pray that you to help us uh, be an encouragement to them and keep them in prayer each day. And we do ask for the church uh, requests ministries, and we just pray that uh, we look over these ministries and pray for them daily and uh, and be able to let God use us in a, in a very, very mighty way of searching our whole soul and knowing just exactly who you want us to pray for and what ministries you want brought uh, out and to pray more. And we do pray for our our people that are up for the uh, presence. We pray that you'd uh, lead and put your hand in this and that uh, your perfect will be done in this case. And we ask that you'd help us now at this time. And, and we do pray that you'd be with the pastor as he brings a message that you'll bless him and that the spirit would be mo able to move freely throughout this service tonight. And we pray for each and everything, the songs and uh, the remainder of the service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 191, 191, if you would, stand with me as we sing. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. 191, let's sing that first together. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burning with the load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. What God has done. Amen. Let's take a couple of stanzas, greet one another, make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, let's sing that last together. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. All right, be seated if you will. The ushers will come and get our offering tonight and give as God has blessed and prospered you this evening. This will go towards our country fair again and the uh, expenses that we get for that. And uh, that's an investment. And I'm excited about this year's fair. We'll be saying more about that as we get closer to it. And uh, some things, we have some, some different plans that will uh, give us opportunity to give the gospel to some people that day. And uh, it will be an exciting time. All right. Let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Brother Abrams, lead us in our prayer, please. Lord, our Heavenly Father. We come before your uh, throne of undeserved kindness once again, and uh, uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for the uh, beautiful spring weather, and uh, we thank you for uh, so many things in our lives that uh, 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 have gone unspoken and uh, things that we should uh, be thanking you for daily, Lord, and uh, uh, we uh, bring those things before you today, and uh, we ask you to bless this offering and uh, bless our country fair day. Uh, may the kids have a wonderful time, but most of all, let us see sa souls saved, Lord, and uh, that be our ultimate goal. And uh, we have a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, burden for the uh, lost, Lord, and uh, uh, may we keep that first and foremost in our hearts. And, Lord, we thank you very much for a wonderful day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Take your Bible tonight. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and then put, put a finger or a piece of paper in Acts 19, all right? Acts 19. 2 Corinthians 6 and Acts 19. While you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Uh, the, there's some beautiful flowers down on the table in the foyer. Uh, who's responsible for those? Anybody? I'm sorry? 
Nikki Slaybaugh brought those in. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. You heard it through the grapevine, huh? Is that what you're saying? Uh, all right. I just, I didn't know, they're beautiful. I didn't know who to thank for them or what, who was responsible for that. But uh, if that's who Kay says it is, that's who it is, all right? <laughs> no pressure, though, Kay. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Notice what the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight, and others as we uh, look in your word this evening about this important doctrine. I pray, God, that you would open our understanding. Lord, I want to help every believer here to understand and to grasp this important doctrine of your word. Lord, we might benefit from it, and we might be obedient in your sight as believers. So, Lord, help us uh, as we look into your word. And Spirit of God, guide us and lead us. And help us not only to say what's right, but to say it in the right way. And may you use it in the hearts and lives of people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start a new series this evening. And I honestly, I don't know how long it'll go. I've, I've written out, oh, I think uh, maybe eight or nine lessons at this point. Uh, I'm going to talk about the doctrine of separation. The doctrine of separation. It is, if there is one doctrine that is neglected by the church today, it is the doctrine of separation. Um, there are certain verses, for example, there's a passage we just read in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Um, that passage, along with um, 1 John 2, verses 15, verse, start verse 15, where it says, Love not the world. Neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Uh, I, I, I remember a couple sitting in my office. They had been in a, in a, in a different kind of a church, and uh, they had attended there for six years. And when, we, uh, when they heard those verses preached, they came to me and said, we had been in church for six years, and we didn't even know those verses were in the Bible never had been touched on, never had been expounded upon, uh, no, no teaching whatsoever on being separate from the world. Uh, and I realize that's because the Christianity today wants to be accepted by the world. We want to embrace the world. And, and many of the modern, and, and I'm talking about a modern church, uh, sometimes you can't, if you go back, and some of us are old enough to remember the... Uh, discos of the 70s and the, the lights and the music and all that and some of that same atmosphere is present in many churches on Sunday morning around America. And we have to ask ourselves, whatever happened to the doctrine of separation? What does God mean when He says in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 6, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Uh, what does it mean to be separate? What does the doctrine of separation mean? We have many, many churches that, that you're not going to hear what you're going to hear over the next eight or nine weeks or ten weeks. Okay, I understand that. Uh, but, but I want you to know that I, I'm not here to get a crowd. I, I am here to teach you the whole counsel of God. Okay, and, and, and I want to just give you the truth. And I don't give you the truth because I'm trying to hurt you. I'm giving you the truth because I want to help you. <laughs> I, I want you to know, I know there's, there, there are people in this room that, that, that understand separation and have enjoyed the benefits of separation uh, through, the world, through, through, the, through the years, but they only enjoy it because somebody was brave enough to tell them and to teach them. 
And you'll never get it if somebody doesn't at least teach it to you. And so I want to help you. And I want to teach you something about separation over these next several weeks. All right? <clears throat> so the Lord says, Come out from among them, be separate, and touch not the unclean thing. Why would He say that? Why would God say, Come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing? You know why He said that? Because when that which is holy comes in contact with that which is unholy, the holy becomes unholy. All right? When something that is clean comes in contact with something that is unclean, then the clean becomes unclean. That's the, that's the principle all through the Bible. When, hey, when, when, when someone is sick, well, what they need to do is come in contact with someone who's well. And then they'll get well. No, what happens? They get sick. Exactly right. In fact, we quarantine sick people not as a punishment to the sick person, but as a uh, safeguard um, or protection for the healthy people. When you're sick and you have a fever and uh, you, you have a flu bug or something like that, or you're coughing and hacking, and you know what you do? You don't come to church because you don't want other people to get what you have. You see? Because you know that you, you don't think, but you know what? There'll be a hundred people there that are well. And if I go there, I'll get well. It won't happen that way. That's not the principle that works all through the Bible. You know, this past Christmas, I got a, uh, my wife for Christmas got me an overcoat. And um, it was black. Is it black or gray? It's something like that. I don't, huh, I don't even remember what color it is. And, um, but, you know, I remember one day one walking into church one evening and she goes, oh, you've got white stuff all over your coat. And I, you know, pulled around and sure enough, there it is, you know. And trying, now, where do you think that came from? That came from I brushed up against my dirty car. You ever done that? Now, I went outside. Now, my clean coat's dirty. I went outside and expected to see my, a clean spot in my car. Guess what? I couldn't find any. My car was still dirty. You see, the clean didn't make the, any difference in the dirty, but the dirty sure made a difference in the clean. That's always the principle in the Bible. In fact, you remember, we just got off the resurrection when Christ had risen from the dead. And remember when Mary's weeping and, and she asked what's wrong and she supposed him to be the gardener until he said her name, Mary, and then she knew it was Jesus. You remember what Jesus said next? Don't touch me. Why not? I have not yet ascended my Father. He hadn't gone up to heaven yet as our high priest to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat of heaven to make atonement for our sin there. And, and if she touched him, he's holy, she's unholy, he would be unholy and not able to offer that sacrifice, not able to offer that blood. You see, if, if Jesus himself could say, don't touch me or I'll become unholy. Why do we think we can be around unholy and it won't affect us? Oh, I can do this, so it doesn't affect me. Well, then you're saying you're better than Jesus. And that's, that's, that's saying quite a bit. Okay, and, and you wouldn't mind if I took Jesus aside on that, all right? Job 14, verse 4, interesting verse. Job says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean. Not one. That was his answer. Nobody can. You can't bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. Now, I want you to go over to Acts 19. Would you look there, please? Acts chapter 19. Here we have this kind of an example of what we're, we're speaking of a little bit here when it comes to separation. As Paul is on the missionary journey. Verse number 8 of Acts 19. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, 
disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus, or Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So notice in the verse here, in verse 9, when diverse of them were hardened, and they believed not, and then it says they spake evil of that way before the multitude, then what did Paul do? He separated from them. He separated from them. He distanced himself from them. It, it, it doesn't mean he didn't witness to them. It doesn't mean that he doesn't, wasn't a soul winner. He did give them the gospel. But he, he separated from those who spoke evil of that way and he had the disciples do the same thing. Alright? There's an example of that. And we're going to look more at this as we go through our study here this evening. So what does it mean what does it mean for a Christian to be separate? What does separation do for the believer? You say, okay, if I'm going to be separate, if I come out from being separate, what will that do? I think we see some answers here in this passage here in Acts 19. But uh, we're, going to, we're going to think, first of all, number one, the Bible says it will make you happy. Now that's the opposite of what you think. You will think, oh no, if I be separate, man, that's intended to make me miserable. Okay? No, it'll make you happy. Psalm 1 and verse 1. Do you know it? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay? That's the very first thing. Nor standeth in the way of, nor sitteth in the... Okay, that's the first thing. Blessed, blessed is the man. Alright, what does blessed mean? Happy. Literally it means that you're meeting God's approval are approved of God. Now when it says walketh not, that's separation. Counsel or advice of ungodly people is those who don't love God. And that can take many different forms. It doesn't just mean human beings necessarily that you know personally. You can get counsel from music you listen to. You can get counsel from television programs you watch. You can get counsel from radio programs you listen to. You can get counsel from friends that you have, obviously. You can get counsel from things you look up on the Internet. And of course, if it's on the Internet, it must be true. No. no you, can, you, can get, you can pick up all kinds of false doctrine on the Internet. Anything you want to believe, you'll find somebody on there who's, who's putting it out. Okay? So I have to be careful then, if I'm not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, I have to be careful then, the books I read, the websites I go to, the television I watch, the music I listen to, the friends I run with. I have to be on guard that I'm not, I'm not following, I'm not listening to the counsel, the advice of people who don't love God. So he says, remember, blessed or happy is the man who does that. Approved of God. In other words, listen, what, what meets the approval of God makes me happy. That's what ought to be the criteria. We, we want to always think, well, I, I, I want to be happy. The goal of the Christian is not for me to be happy. The goal of the Christian is, I want God to be happy. I want to bring a smile to God's face. Hey, we were created for His pleasure. We've kind of turned that cattywampus. That's a big Greek word, isn't it? We've turned that cat. What have we done? Uh, you listen, God's here for my pleasure. I mean, God's here for me. That's why you'll see posts all the time about your, 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 just keep praying your, your day's ready to come, your breakthrough's coming, God's going to bless you abundantly, it's your, your days are here, you're ready to go. And everybody likes that. Oh yeah, man, that's great. God's ready to pour out a blessing on you, God's ready to use you in a great way, God's going to do something tremendous for you, you just watch, it's coming now, your time has come. Wow, amen. 
In other words, God is here for me. Or am I supposed to be here for God? Am I supposed to be here for His pleasure? Am I supposed to be here to make sure that He's happy? Now, God says, I'll be happy. And I, by the way, that's why, this isn't in your notes at all, but listen, that's why in Nehemiah, he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay? That means, I'm the, the joy of the Lord. What brings joy to the Lord strengthens me. If it doesn't bring joy to the Lord, I don't get any strength from that. We think whatever brings me joy strengthens me. And whatever brings you joy strengthens self. And you don't need self to be any strength, strengthened any more than what it is. Okay? And so he says, blessed is the man. Now, notice, you notice the slippery slope here in Psalm 1, don't you? Walking, standing, sitting. Okay? There is a slippery slope downward. Then he says, you don't stand in the way of sinners. And it's, 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 a, it's a digression. If I walk in the counsel of the ungodly, the next step is I'll stand in the way with sinners. I won't just be walking with them. I won't just be listening to them. I'll be standing with them. And what does that mean? It means you begin to criticize those who don't want to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Boy, that preacher's too narrow. Man, he's just way too strict. Nobody, nobody, nobody going to live that way. He's too harsh. Doesn't he know we're in the 21st century? And, and we get to thinking that, he, that he's way off base. And you find yourself, listen, you find yourself having more sympathy for the ungodly than you do support for what the Word of God says. And you side more with those who are not living up to what God says than you do for what the Bible says God says. Well, that's quiet. And I'll illustrate it. Let me, and I've done this, and I'll probably do it several times during the course of this, okay? But I'm gonna, I'll use these guys since they're right up front. Mark, stand up for me, all right? Brother, put your stuff down, okay? This is not in your notes, so you won't miss any blanks, okay? <laughs> all right, here we go. Stand up, face crowd here, all right? Okay, for illustration purposes, okay, this, this Mark's going to be the world, okay, all right, so he represents who? The world, all right, for illustration purposes, okay, Bill is going to represent, we're going to make him represent God, okay, now, come over here, I know, it's all I got to work with, okay, but it's all right, <laughs> now, all right, this is God, this is the world, okay, opposites friendship the Bible says friendship uh, with the world means you are the enemy of God they are polar opposites you can't be a friend of both okay so the church what happens is the church is separate from the world okay we're to be separate from the world and separated unto God all right now does the world get better or does the world get worse Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So the world gets worse. They get further from God. Take a couple steps that way, Mark. Okay, good. All right. Now, wait a minute. Here's what takes place. The world gets worse. Go ahead. Okay. Now, I'm the church. I'm the Christian. Now, wait a minute. Now, where's the Christian? Who used to be here? The world used to be here. But now I'm here. Why? Because the world's still worse. Still worse than I am. But I'm where the world used to be. And I'm not any closer to God. I'm further away from God. And here's what happens. You come into an independent, Bible-believing Baptist church, and the pastor begins to teach about separation, and he puts the separation where you're separate from the world and you're supposed to be close to God, and you say, man, is he weird. Where did he come up with that stuff? No, this is where the church should have been all along. Does God ever change? No. Is God the same? Yeah. So as the world gets worse, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a harder time distinguishing a Christian from the world. 
It should be easier to distinguish a Christian from the world. You say, well, they'll all think I'm weird. Okay. So what's your, what's your question? Okay. We, are, we are a peculiar people to God. And you'll, you'll see that as we go through some of the studies. But this is, this is what happens. And the problem we've got is so many in Christianity today are perfectly content to just be here. But listen, I, I grew up I grew up in church. I grew up in Bible-believing churches. I grew up hearing the music that is allowable in churches now preached against as rock music when I was a teenager. That now is completely permissible in many churches. Because it's not as, still not as bad as what that is. Okay, And all we're doing is we're just shifting. As it gets worse, we just keep shifting. And we're not exactly like the world, but we're, we're, we're maintaining the same distance, but they're getting worse, and so are we. You okay? You understand? That, I'm telling you, I've watched it happen. Some of you have seen the same thing. You've seen it happen. And that's why, listen, and, and people, listen, many pastors are not willing to come and teach you the Bible standard over here because people will say, man, if that's what they believe, I'm not coming here anymore. but I'm telling you the truth. I'll give you the scriptures. And if, you, if you've got a problem, then you've got to wrestle with the scriptures. See? You know, your, your issue isn't with the pastor. Your issue will be with the word of God. And, 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 and let's make sure we're doing, I want to be where God wants me to be. Okay? That's, that's the important thing. So keep this little illustration in mind as we go through our studies, okay? Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right? Now, so we don't walk in the counsel of ungodly. We don't stand in the way of sinners. And number three, it says we don't sit in the seat of the scornful. So now, now the now that digression is complete, you're not just listening to them. You're not just standing with them and, and entering into their complaint and their criticism of those who want to live godly, but you're actually scoffing and mocking at the people who want to do what God wants and what God desires. What are you, why, are you, why are you doing that? You don't have to do that. Come, you're going to church on Wednesday night. What's that about? I don't have, you don't have to do that. And here's, let, let, let me clear another misconception up, okay? Because when that happens, the favorite, let me tell you, the favorite, favorite phrase of these who want to be scornful or mock, well, you go to a legalistic church. Okay? Let me explain to you what legalism is. It's from the book of Galatians. And, and legalism is where we believe you have to keep the law or keep do certain works in order to be accepted by God. Oh, I suppose if I do this, I'll go to hell. No, if you don't accept Jesus, you'll go to hell. Nothing else is going to send you to hell. I have people say, so I smoke cigarettes, will I go to hell? I always say, no, you smell like you've been there, but you won't go to hell. Okay? But that doesn't send you to hell. The Bible doesn't say you just smoke cigarettes goes to hell. It doesn't say that if you do this or do that or you cuss or you drink or you sweat. It doesn't say that. That's not legalistic. But there is a blessed is the man. Happy is the man. Approved of God is the man that walks not in the counsel of ungodly, stands not in the way of sinners, and sits not in the seat of the scornful. Doesn't mock the people that want to please God and want to live for Him. Are you scornful? The way to tell is, do you try to pull others down to your level? Or do you try to live better to please God? If you desire blessing, if you desire approval of God, then you must come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Separation. It's the way to happiness. It's the way to God's approval. Psalm chapter 1. Okay? Now, number two. So the first reason, what will the uh, separation do for the Christian? It'll make you happy. It'll give you the approval of God. Number two, it identifies us. It identifies us. 
Notice what it said in, in chapter 19, in verse 9. When divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of, what's the next two words? That way, before the multitude, he departed from them. They spoke evil of that way. That way that they believed, that way that they lived. Oh, you guys are that way. You ever hear anybody say that to you? Oh, you guys are that way. You see, it, and that, that's what it was. It was a way. Listen, Christianity is not just something you made a decision about years ago. Christianity is a way of life. It's a way we live. You can't, you can't divorce it. If you can't, it's not just something, oh yeah, I accepted Jesus years ago. Or, you know, you take the, you know, if, if you put me in court and put me on the stand and I was on trial, you'd never be able to convict me of being a Christian, but... I, I made that decision years ago. That's not Bible Christianity. Okay? Bible Christianity is the way you live. Look in, turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, will you? James chapter 1. Are you okay? Everybody. Jesus wants everybody happy. Jesus wants everybody glad. Jesus wants everybody happy, 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 and he doesn't want anybody sad. Okay? James chapter 1. Notice verse number 27. Will you please? Verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So it says, here we are. The first thing about pure religion, undefiled before God, is we're going to help the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. In other words, we're helping those who can never repay our efforts. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. One thing that, listen, one thing that I think that, that why, why, you know, that, that, Mr. Trump doesn't understand when he says that, you know, we shouldn't be in this country helping them or that country helping them without them paying us. Why does Americans do that? Because Americans have always helped people who couldn't help us in return. Now, some of those places are simply places where we feel like we need to have a military presence or they'll, the wrong people will take over that area of the world and then we're in trouble. But, but we've always done that. We always send aid to people. We're always the first ones on the scene because America's roots are in Christianity. And we want to help those who are, who are less, who have less, less, and we're not doing it to get something in return. We're just doing it to help people. That's what Christians do. Love is the willing, sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of others with no thought of return. I want to help you, and I'm not thinking about what's in it for me. And that's so, so Jesus said, you know, when the disciples came back, Jesus had sat down at the well, and the woman at the well came to draw water. The disciples came back with the, the, the food. What did they remember what they thought to themselves? Why is he talking to her? You know what they meant? He can't do anything. She can't do anything for him. She's a Samaritan. Why would he care about her? See? And and you care about, listen, we care about people. And we care about all people. Somebody say, well, you know, you've heard me say before, what, who's your church targeting? We're targeting anybody with a pulse. Amen. So well, don't, don't you worry about what they can do for you? No. Amen. Worry about that at all. Wanna, everybody has a soul for whom Christ died. Amen. We want to reach them with the gospel. That's pure religion and undefiled before God. So we help them. And we want to do it with no thought of return. And, and listen, by and large, the church, the, the church in the 21st century doesn't have any problem with that. And you'll hear that preached, you'll hear that taught, and, and they'll, they'll excel at that. But there is a second part to that verse. It's not only to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, it's to keep himself, what church? Unspotted from the world. We leave that, we leave that part out. We just skip right over that. Someone said there seem to be a lot of Dalmatian Christians. They're spotted from the world. 
unable to tell them apart. Look the same, dress the same, music is the same, language is the same, TV programs is the same. You have to admit something. Spots are on the outside. Spots are what people see. They're visible things. They're not on the inside. So what is that? That's our testimony. That's what people see. Man does look on the outward. Our outward testimony then is not necessarily for God. It's for man. We want to be a testimony to those who are in this world. So, listen, when I, when I look as a Christian, when I, when I take consideration, well, will folks look at me and know that I'm a Christian? Or at least think I'm a Christian? I want to identify with Christians. I want to identify with those who are not Christians. Let me ask you a question. Why does the, why does the military wear their uniforms? You've got to know which side, who's your... Who's your friend and who's your foe? <clears throat> I like that. when you watch a sporting event. Why do the two teams always wear a different color uniform? You got to identify who your team is and who the other team is. You identify whose side you're on and whose side you're rooting for. It's not unusual. Sometimes when I'm in a in a store. And if I have my shirt and tie on and I'm looking at something in the store, it's inevitable someone walks up to me and says, do you work here? I've helped so many people find something in the store. Say, well, sure, well, how can I help you? you know? No, I have. I just say, no, I don't. I... Why do they think I work there? Because the way I'm dressed. It identified me. It identified me. I said something, there's a... Uh, what color blue? It's a color blue. That, you know what I'm talking about? The RU shirt that's kind of blue. It's not the navy blue. It's the other kind of, what kind of, what do you call that color? It's almost like a royal blue. It's kind of, it's almost like what the paramedics look like, what they wear, those kind of shirts. And, and it has red, and it has the cross here, you know what I mean? But it has red, so you almost look like a paramedic. I had someone stop me at Cracker Barrel when I had that on on a Friday night coming to RU here, and we had dinner there, and somebody said, oh, what? What, what unit do you work for? <laughs> and to say, I'm not a paramedic. But, but they identified like one. See? It, it, it does make a difference. See? Your separation identifies you. It lets people know who's... Hey, I want people to know whose side I'm on. I don't want there to be any... any Mis, uh, misconceptions at all. Anybody guessing? You've all done the same thing. You've been in a store. You've seen somebody, and if 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 you see two ladies walk in and they're dressed nice and they're dressed modestly and their hair's fixed and they look nice, yet every one of you looked at them and said, "I wonder if they're Christians." May not be. May just be somebody dressed up. But it's but it is rare indeed anymore that you see the world dress up for much. And especially modestly dress up for much. And so it's a testimony. And I, you have to ask yourself this. Whose side am I identifying with? Whose side am I on? I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And I will gladly and happily wear the uniform that, 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 that lets everyone know I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't want there to be a mistake about that. Listen, what we do identifies us. And you have to understand that. Running a bus route identifies us. Personal soul winning identifies us. Using the King James Bible identifies us. It does. And the way we dress identifies us. Acts 11 and verse 26. Would you look there? Acts 11 and verse 26. You know the story here that the Christians have scattered and a great number get saved in Antioch 
Barnabas goes down, he gets Saul, brings him back, and in verse 26, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, that's Barnabas and Saul, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They didn't, listen, did they call themselves Christians first? No. Who called them Christians? Other people did. They identified them by how they lived and by how they looked, by their, by their outward identification. Those are followers of Jesus Christ. Okay? That it identifies us. I'm not ashamed to be identified as a Christian. I'm unashamed. Okay? So it identifies us. How, all right, what does separation do for us? Number one, makes us happy. Approval, meet the approval of God. Number two, it identifies us. Number three. Number three, go back to Acts 19, would you please? Acts 19. Acts 19, verse number 10, this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You know, I want to be separate. Remember, they separated in verse 9 and everybody heard the gospel in verse 10, so it helps me give the gospel. It helps me give the gospel. It actually makes me a better witness. For Jesus Christ. It didn't say all of them got saved. But it did say they all heard. And, and that is our job. Is to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. Not all will get saved. But all ought to hear how to be saved. They all ought to hear it. I read a quote this week. The only, thing, the only thing worse than being lost is being lost with no one looking for you. Talking about the unreached people of this world. Lost and nobody's looking for you. That's sad. They all heard. They all heard. The appeal... Listen, the appeal to salvation in Jesus Christ from an unseparated, unholy Christian distorts the message. It gives an uncertain sound. The clear message of the gospel needs a clear testimony to go with it. Let's look, you're in Acts. Go to Acts 16. Would you turn over there, please? Are you all right? Everybody okay? Everybody okay? I, don't, I hope you're not sitting there thinking, well, I'm never coming back here. Well, I, I, you'll hear the truth while you're here, I guess, all right? Amen. Acts 16. Acts 16 is a very interesting passage here. Notice verse number 16. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So Lydia's gotten saved. That's what took place a few verses earlier. And now they're in, they're in Philippi. And there's a damsel with a demon in her. And she begins to follow Paul around and, and, and his entourage. And look what she says. Did you read it? She says, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Let me ask you a question. Is that true? Absolutely. That is exactly the truth. But Paul cast the demon out and had her shut up. Why? That's not the, the testimony that he wanted them, her sharing the gospel with people. 
You see, the, the, the verbal didn't match the visible. The visible and the verbal ought to go together. And by the way, the world gets this. Some of the, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this. Those of you who watch sporting events at all, the most clever commercials on television are what? Beer commercials. They've never yet made a beer commercial where they're walking out of church saying, yeah, that was a good message, wasn't it? And they pop open a Budweiser and say, it doesn't get any better than this. Why? They know. You don't, that's, that doesn't go with church. They know that. How come, how come they get that the messages don't mix and Christians don't get it? You mess, the, the, the visible has to match the verbal. And the, you don't have to turn there, but Galatians 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, it, 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 verse 3 says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. If someone's drowning in quicksand, do you jump in to save them? No. You must be on solid ground and reach for them to pull them out. You'll never reach the world by trying to be like them. You reach the world. The appeal is in the difference, not in the sameness. If I'm just like them, why get saved? There's no appeal to that. You say, but the world, world will think I'm, the world, the world will hate me. Uh, Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Don't forget, they crucified Jesus, and we're followers of Him. All right. So we said three things so far, what separation will do for the Christian. Number one, it'll make me happy. Number two, it'll meet or it'll identify me. And number three, it helps me give the gospel. Number four, it'll help me or allow me to have miracle working power. Back in Acts 19. Verse 11, it says, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Miracle working power. Listen, we're not... Uh, I, these are... There were some sign gifts that God gave and that would be one of them here. But it does, And that, that means that the power for a man to just put hands on you and get healing, that, that's not in place anymore. But God still heals people. God is still in the healing business. But I can, I can throw my handkerchief on... Who's got an ailment here? Everybody? Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can throw my... If you've got a bad knee, I throw this hanky on your knee, and guess what? You're going to have a hanky on your knee. That's all that's going to happen, all right? Uh, but listen to me. God heals people. It's the, uh, listen, God is the healer and He still is in the miracle working business. We talked about it earlier. Does God ever change? No. God, I'm the Lord thy God. I change not. So God can still heal people. And He has the power to heal people. And He wants to give that power and He allows that power. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not interested in what flesh can do. I'm not interested in what man can do. I would like to see what God could do. To see something happen that nobody can explain it, they just have to say, God did that. God did that. I want to be holy and separate so that I can be yoked with God. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my 
yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest under your souls. We're getting into, um, we're yoked up with Christ. That's why you don't get yoked up with unbelievers. You don't get yoked up with people who don't love God. You don't get yoked up with folks who don't want to be around Christ. You don't get in that yoke with them. I'm yoked up with God. So I listen, I don't work for God. I work with God. I work with God. And that's the difference between, listen, a Pharisee and a separated Christian. A lot of times you say, oh, you, you fundamental Christians, you're just Pharisees. No, the Pharisee quit. They, they, they tried to separate from everything that's wrong, but they had no desire to draw close to God. They had no desire to work with God. They just wanted to look down their nose on everybody who was doing wrong. And, and I'm not doing wrong, and I don't want to touch the unholy because I want to draw nigh to the holy. I want to draw nigh to God. I want to be ye holy, as he told Peter, for I am holy. And listen, to many, many Christians, the reason they don't feel very close to God is very simple. Because you're not holy. You still have too many unholy associations. And until you're willing to leave them, you're never going to be close to God. How can a, how can a husband and a wife grow close together if the husband and the wife never leave the old boyfriends or girlfriends? It'll never work. you never have that closeness. You'll never have that intimacy that, that, that you desire. And neither will a Christian with God. So I separate from the world that I might draw nigh to God. There's no value in just separating from the world if I'm not going to draw nigh to God. But I want His power. God doesn't give that cheaply. Acts 1.8 Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. <coughs> but to get that power He told them to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. How long did they tarry, church? Ten days. Ten days of prayer. Ten days in the upper room. Ten days waiting on God. Ten days seeking the power He spoke about. And it came. It came. The average Christian doesn't spend ten minutes a day praying. And we wonder why we have no power. We don't have any problem watching a two-hour ball game. But boy, we pray for two minutes or 20 minutes and it seems like we really did something great today. You see, you need the, the, the clean connection so the power of God can flow through us. Sometimes when, when you have a car that, remember, uh, several years ago, we had somebody, they were having trouble with their car and it couldn't, wouldn't start and they thought it was a bad battery. When they popped the hood and opened it up, they found out there was a bunch of corrosion on the battery cables. And they, they I won't tell you what they used. Well, yeah, well, they used Coca-Cola. And uh, those of you who drink that, that's what that does. It, it, and you take a little brush, they clean those off and they were loose and they tightened them up. And guess what? They got in the car and you know what happened? started right up. The problem wasn't in the power source. The problem was in the connectors. It wasn't getting the power because they were all mucked up. They were all, all, all goobered up. Boy, that's a big word, isn't it? Huh? You know what that? That's what, that's what sin and unholiness does. And God's power cannot come through. Those leadings of the Spirit don't come through. You don't have that. And you know it. Most, most of us, listen, most of us don't really, most, very few Christians have really experienced the power of God in their life. We know, we're not sure what that is, but we, most of us all know what it isn't. Because we've done that. And time to get the cables cleaned off. Trying to get those cleaned off and confess the sin and forsake the sin. The power source is fine. He's willing. He's able. And we have to be able to be vessels of honor 
that His power can flow through us. Why separation? I desire for you to be happy. I desire for you to have the approval of God. Listen, not acceptance of God. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You're accepted by God because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about what, what that separation does in your relationship with God. Nobody's saved by being separate. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So don't, don't let somebody throw legalist out at you. They don't know their terms. Nobody is saying you have to do anything like this to be saved. You would put your faith in Christ to be saved. But to, have, to be happy as a believer, to identify yourself on God's team, to help you be an effective witness for Christ, to be able to experience God's miracle-working power in your life. You want to come out from among them and be separate. But listen, it's your choice. God, doesn't force, God didn't force salvation on you. He doesn't force separation on you. He lets you know it's there, and it's, that's what He desires. But you have to will. You have to want it. You have to desire it. You have to make that decision. Now next week, we'll start talking a little bit about uh, standards and convictions when it comes to being separate, Okay? And we'll look forward to that next Wednesday night, all right? Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to look into your word. And, Lord, I realize this is a subject that is not often spoken of, not even in Bible-believing churches anymore. But, Lord, I, I want to be like the Apostle Paul who said to the church at Ephesus, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Lord, I love these people. And I want the best that you have for them. I desire that they have the approval of God in their life. That they identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. That they be effective in their witness for the Lord. And that they experience your mighty power in their life. So Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take these scriptures we've looked at tonight and put it into each one of our hearts. Enable us to live the Bible we've learned this evening. We'd obey your command to come out from among them and be ye separate. And we will not be the friend of the world, but we'll desire to be the friend of God. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord, and make us mindful you go with us from this place. Use us to influence others for Jesus Christ. It's in His name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground. Higher ground. Here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. God bless you. You are dismissed.